Well, good morning to you. Uh, the theme of this year is really about relationships, calling it something like real relationships, authentic relationships, want friends, be one. And uh, one of the things that kind of got my mind going on, on this theme, you know, this year is, is uh, some of you in your, your guys' Christmas letters. One Christmas letter I think I got from, from Aaron Peterson in, in our church, that, uh, or Aaron Baker now, <laughs> that, uh, that, that said um, really about the importance of really knowing each other and knowing where we're hurting and sharing that with others in our, in our small groups and in our Bible studies and our, just our fellowship. So we ought to just share our hurts before it's too late because so often there's hurts going on in our lives and things are happening and things we could really need a good friend or a helping hand and we don't ever share it with people until it's too late or, or it's, it's well along the way of a destructive tendency that's, that's happened in our life and we've already hurt ourselves. And, and so with that kind of in mind, I thought, you know, there's, there's good reason for having uh, the church focus on fellowship. The idea of fellowship, where we really know one another and celebrate being God's family, the household of God, where we carry each other's burdens and we, we encourage one another and we pray for one another and confess our sins even with one another that we might be healed because the prayer of a righteous man availeth much, as we, we learn from James. And so there's all kinds of reasons to encourage good fellowship, good relationship. We, we need one another in, in life, and so we want to breathe that uh, through our church body. Now today, as we begin, you know, some different kinds of relationships that build up the church that are so important because how the relationships in the church go is, is how the church goes, how it interacts and, and how well it's doing, how healthy it is, is depending upon how uh, relationships in the home, relationships with colleagues and friends uh, that go to that church is all important. So today, we're talking about marriage, kind of one of the fundamental uh, building blocks of the church. People have said how the home goes, so the church goes because... Uh, the relationships in the home are so important uh, to what's going on in the church. It's a building block there. And so I wanted to talk about marriage and God's reason for it. Uh, and and uh, because the, the, the home is important, the family is important, so certainly the marriage is important because those are the leadership positions that God put in that nucleus, that, that cell of a home, that building block for the church. And it's a lot easier to pastor a church or shepherd a church that, where the homes are doing well than it is when they're not, and it just makes, makes sense, uh, and so in a society and culture where the home is breaking down, you can see that that would be carried into the church and causing all kinds of struggles and heartache, because the church is the people, and the people are the homes and the families, and so I've been reading a, a book recently, it's a Russell Moore's book, who's the head of the ERLC uh, back, uh, back east, and um, he wrote this book called The Storm-Tossed Family, and how the cross reshapes the home. And he writes this in his book. Family can be the source of the most transcendent human joy. And family can leave us crumpled up on the side of the road. Family can make us who we are, and family can break our hearts. Why would this social arrangement have that much power for good or for ill over us? The only safe harbor for a storm-tossed family is a nail-scarred home. You know, the difference that Christ and his blood shed for each one of us, that, that the, those who receive him and as individuals that are redeemed, the redeemed people of God, helps, it helps in understanding and navigating and getting through all that's thrown at us through the family, which has enormous power to shape our lives, either hurt us badly or to give us a transcendent joy that beyond measure. And so I couldn't agree more with Dr. Moore's words, and I know factually that people getting married and having kids is also considered one of the greatest growth engines of the church. I was told that by Steve Stroops, a, a pastor down there in Dallas, Texas, that, that uh, was mentoring me, who said, do you know that as, as people uh, have kids, as people are developing their families, is the time when people begin to go back to church, people that start going to church for the first time or return to church. Because they're like, wow, I don't know how to do all this. I don't know. I need, I need some help. And they start looking towards the things of God. And so it, it's a good thing. Uh, Josh McDowell, as a famously said at his son's graduation at Biola University, he was asked to speak at the graduation commencement, uh, the service. And he got up there to speak, and he sat down after saying these words. Make sure and love your spouse and spend lots of time with your kids. Because how you feel about the success of your life later on will depend greatly on this. The family building blocks, the relationships of, of, within the household of your, the walls of your house are, are so important. 
And so as we begin this new year together in which we focus on real relationships, we want to see how Jesus is the key relationship to all others. How it's the hub in the middle of the spokes of the wheel that we've been talking about. And he's, when he's in the, the, the middle, when we have an intimate relationship with Jesus, it's easier to have an intimate relationship and more healthy relationship with others. So we're going to focus on these key relationships and how they work this year. And the marriage relationship, certainly we're going to talk about because authentic foundational relationships for a strong fellowship in a church begins in that home. Now, author, pastor uh, Steve Stroops also wrote a book called It All Starts at Home. My own journey with Christ began in my home. I was uh, mentored first by my mom and dad. First, in the, my journey began in a Christian family that uh, lived out each day the words that were spoken in the church on Sunday and Wednesday nights. They were brought to our home and they were lived out before me. And I saw the behavioral differences. I saw the decision differences of a couple of people that took honoring the Lord serious and took his word serious. And so you can uh, uh, probably imagine in all this, if the family and if the marriage, the head of that family is so important and, and, and so instrumental to the fellowship that's also happening in the church and affecting so many relationships and what has happening in those families, you can probably also imagine how the enemy would want to make the family and the marriage specifically a center target for him. It's something that he if, he, if the enemy wants to destroy all of man, mankind and destroy relationships, he is certainly going to target our marriages. Just makes sense. And thus attacking the home, thus attacking the marriage unit, union, causing turmoil and chaos, has all, all kinds of opportunity also to attack the Lord's church, the Lord's greater family. And so we're going to listen to God's word on an important thought on marriage from this perspective. In Hebrews 13, 4, it says this, Marriage should be honored by all. Marriage should be honored by all, and the marriage bed kept pure, for God will judge the adulterer and all the sexual immoral. It goes on for some extra things, but I want to focus on the first part of that verse, which says, Marriage should be honored by all. Did you catch who should be honoring marriage? Whether, whether you're single or married, whether you're young or, or uh, old, whether you're educated or non-educated, uh, whatever country you come from, whatever ethnic group you are a part of, all on this globe should honor marriage. From the perspective of God, all should honor this thing we call marriage. So regardless whether uh, I've been married in the past, but I'm not now, or I'm single, haven't ever been married, or whether I'm uh, married right now, whether I'm unhappy in my marriage, whether I'm, I'm not happy, whether I'm happy, I'm going to honor marriage because God says so. Now sadly, marriage is no longer honored by everyone in our society. In fact, it's the exact opposite of what I'm seeing and what's growing. Today, marriage is dismissed as irrelevant by many people, as archaic for some. Who needs, who needs to get married? That's something maybe for another generation or a, another culture, something that's man-made lifestyle choice. And it's dismissed. So no one needs to get married. It's demeaned by many people. It's a career buster. You're getting married. Oh, there goes your career. Marriage is delayed by many people. Sometimes it's delayed for good reasons, but sometimes it's delayed for selfish reasons. Marriage is being redefined. It's being ridiculed. It's being demeaned. It's being denounced. It's being discouraged. Marriage is being disrespected. We don't live in a culture where marriage is honored by everyone anymore, and even sometimes Christians fall into the trap of, of degrading or bringing down the importance of a marriage. Part of the problem is that nobody knows the basics of marriage anymore even 30 years ago i think if i were to go out on the street back then and say hey tell me the purpose of marriage i would get five or six answers or purposes of people about marriage and what it means and what it's for why it's necessary but nobody seems to know these things today if we were going out on the street today to ask some people hey what's the purpose of marriage you won't get some of the reasons it's, it's more than a lifestyle choice something ordained by God and it's his idea for his purposes so since the fellowship of the church depends so much on the fellowship of the home and the home depends so much on marriage it's important to understand the reason that God has put together such a critically important relationship and his reasons for it I probably don't have an exhaustive list but I'm going to call this God's top six reasons for marriage three this week and three next week 
And if we all lived by these reasons and all honored marriage because of them, our world would be different. The fellowship in our churches would be different. They would be more enriched. So I want you to pay attention this morning because I think there's some practical things to pull out of a message like this that really gears down to the home and how we're all doing in it. So here's the first reason for marriage, for the connection of men and women. Pretty simple idea for the connection of men and women. I know in our society today, though, I see more and more uh, uh, things that seem to be pitting men and women against each other. Almost a competition, which is displayed in different comments like, I don't need a man. I can do anything a man can do, but better. Or a man saying, I don't need to be tied down to a woman. You know, I, I'm my own man. I do my own things. I don't want any woman telling me how to live my life or what I can do or nagging on me. I do, I, I do what I want to do. Some even get a little wacky enough to try and play down. There's any differences between the genders at all. You know, they think sameness is equality. They think it's almost, you know, good for a man to be like a woman, a woman to be like a man because there's no difference. And, and so instead of, you know, saying there's no need for competition and, and, and marriage shouldn't be this like coming and smashing against each other, it should be working in harmoni harmoniously together uh, and, and knowing that God made gender. God made both male and female to complement each other to work together as a team and marriage shouldn't be this collision each day and this tension and walking around your house on eggshells trying to not get in trouble or to, to try and prove how much more you're contributing to the, the family and how much more smarter you are and if you did things your way and, and, and seeing who's going to win what argument from each day to the next it should not be that way at all it should be to complement each other to encourage one another to affectionate, affectionately work together knowing that you displaying a need for each other because both of us were made in the image of God that's reflected both through male and female. God is both masculine and feminine. It says he's spirit. He's neither male nor female, but he, the attributes, the descriptions of him, the things we can know about God is he's both masculine and feminine. And, and so even if you're married or not married, your life is enriched by the other sex, by rubbing shoulders with the other people from the other sex, learning from them, seeing how they respond to things because we need each other. You know that's a biblical concept? 1 Corinthians 11, 11 says, Nevertheless, in the Lord, woman is not independent of man, nor is man independent of women. There is a need. I never thought I'd see the day where a simple statement like men and women need each other would be such a radical statement. That's a more radical statement in the day and age we live in. I never thought I'd see that. Maybe you've wondered before why God created men and women separately. One, one reason very well could be so Adam would realize how lonely he'd be in life without a close companion. God made all the animals of the field and the water things and Adam's looking he finds nobody suitable for him and so God says this in Genesis 2 18 he says the Lord God said it is not good for the man to be alone and I will make a helper suitable for him you know there's all kinds of good relationships with people there's work colleagues relationships there's there's uh, grandparents' relationships and parent and kid relationships. There's brotherly love relationships. There's sisters, you know, that you see the different things you can buy at the store. This is nothing like sisters, and, you know, those relationships are important. But we don't see really anything else that compares to the level of relationship than between a man and a woman that are committed together in a covenant relationship for life. And the way that they can draw together and complement each other and help each other where they're weak and where there's and, and, and encourage each other where you're strong is like nothing else that we have in life. It's not just about having a good time together. Some people immediately think, yeah, man, going on vacation with my wife or my husband, man, and going to Disneyland together, going to the beach. Wow, those were such good times. We really were coming together well because we were having fun together. And like, well, anybody can go have a fun time together. But where you'll just so appreciate and so encourage is at the dining room table as you're just going over 
the checkbook and going over your financial issues. And if you have someone that's a good sounding board who compliments you, one of you is usually a spender, one of you is usually a saver. <laughs> and, and you come together to work together to make sure you have a life and also make sure you have enough money to pay the bills that are coming in. And so the responsibility and the free spirits are gathering together to, to make a life. And it's nice to sit down with a person where you can communicate in such a way that where you're on the same page and you're not just sharing the same address but you're sharing your finances together and you're sharing your dreams that you have together and you're sharing your parenting that you're working together as a team and sometimes they say as you grow older couples start looking like each other you know and some, I don't know if it encourages some of you or discourages some of you but you, you start just coming together in ways even on a spiritual basis at your core there's nothing like it there's nothing like, you know, at the end of life, just like, wow, you know, this has been my partner. This has been my best friend. This has been my lover. This has been my sounding board. This has been the person that's made sure that I haven't flown off the edge. It's talked me off the edge. There's nothing like it, and the Lord designed it to be that way. We can say, oh, there's no difference like that. Anybody can do that for you. No, no, the Lord designed this in, in an amazing way. He says in Mark 6, uh, 10, 6 through 9, but at the beginning of creation, and, and Jesus is saying, but at the beginning of this creation, God made them male and female for this reason, that a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So that they're no longer one, two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. So it's, it's really a miraculous, it's not, you know, just your middle school dating relationship and things anymore. This is like what God created. He no longer sees the two, but he sees a coming together where there's one. You know, we'll talk more next week and stuff about even the Trinity, how we try to understand the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, three in one God. That sounds silly, it sounds weird, but the triune God, part of the Nicene Creed, is something that's hard to understand, but he also calls the relationship between a man and woman a great mystery. How do two become one flesh? And, and, and not to be pulled apart and, and, and we wonder why sometimes divorce can hurt so badly and is he so hard to recover from is because there's no just like clear cut like a bone break that just you know it's easily going to come it's, it's a jagged it's a jagged break with all kinds of strings of attack all, all kinds of complications all kinds of heartache because it's one trying to be divided into back into two but there's three radical truths that the Lord gets across to us just in these few verses here in Mark 10. Here, here I wrote them down for you. Three, the three of them here is that marriage is God's plan, not human's invention. Sometimes we wonder, how did pastors get involved in marriage? It's such a civil thing. Isn't it just the government, the, isn't the justice of peace, just do these things and stuff? Well, marriage is God's plan. That's why pastors would get involved in it. It's not a human invention. That's found in this verse. Secondly, that marriage is between a man and a woman. That's found in this verse. A man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife. And third, now I'd say three quick radical truths because these are, you know, we might say, oh, duh, but they're radical in the day and age we live in is that marriage is permanent for life. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. This is meant to be for the years of your life, for this covenant relationship to be together. And when we realize this is God's plan and decided to put God at the center of our marriages and doing things God's way, this is a huge blessing for that couple. There's a rich connection and intimacy there, understanding this was God's original good plan, a great companionship between a man and a woman for life. That's how God designed it. And, and just because it's ideal doesn't mean it's not true. Doesn't mean that it's not uh, what's best. Secondly, God's reason for marriage is for the multiplication of the human race. Again, people might say, well, duh, you know, but a lot of times when I'm asking people like, hey, why are you getting married? The multiplication of the human race doesn't come up. But we know from 1 John that God is Love And without God, there would be no love in the universe. Everything that God does is out of love. 
He made uh, us in the image of God with the capacity through him to love. And so God's vision of having an eternal family made up of people who choose to love him back in heaven with him was God's idea made possible through love and sex and marriage. You know one day all the people that you're going to meet in heaven, if you love the Jesus and he's in your heart, he's in your soul, you've invited him to come uh, into uh, your heart and your place uh, in which you've invited him to, all the people you meet in heaven, someday you meet, are, are gonna, you're going to know they came into existence by love, sex, and marriage. Ideally, it would have been great, you know, if God's plan was through a marriage of having a dad and a mom, male and a female, is, you know, that brought you in into a loving relationship and into an earthly family. That was his uh, ideal. And, and many times we know in the culture society we live in that people aren't coming in that exact way, but all of them are coming through love, sex, or marriage. That's God's way. Uh, uh, and, and because we're made in his image, we all get to experience some amounts of, of love and affection for one another that God has for us. It's all made possible for that through this plan that we're talking about today. Genesis 1, 1, 1, 27 through 28 says, So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground, giving them a special domain over, over the earth to steward and take care of. And, but it all begins with two people coming together and he's saying, hey, go have at it. Multiply the earth. Have kids. Kelly has a picture of our girls on the wall at the bottom of our stairwell and it has a decorative uh, plaque over the top that says, all because two people fell in love. We have a picture of these three beautiful daughters because, all of, because two people fell in love and Kelly and I were just obedient to God and being fruitful and multiplying. One theologian has said this may be the one command mankind has most consistently kept. We've been faithful and having kids all around the planet. I always have a little fun with pre-marriage counseling with couples who want to be married but are, are not in our church. Some of them are not, not, even, are not Christians and they have certain perceptions of pastors and Christians and, and things. Wonder how we all get here in some ways sometimes. They can, I can tell the discomfort uh, from those outside the church with a meeting with a pastor. It's usually especially the guys. There's a question I ask in the curriculum I have them go through. And I ask them the rate on a scale of 1 to 10, the importance of the, the sexual union. And I uh, had some guys before kind of stutter through it. And like, well, you know, it's not the most important thing, but... It's still something that just needs to be done. And I'll tell them, yeah, sort of like the dishes, right? Just kind of have like one chore after another, right? And I'm like, whoa. Not like I say, no, it's not like that at all. God commands us to multiply. He made our bodies to be able to reproduce a way to make the world even a little better to our kids. Now, God's talking about Christian families here, certainly having kids in Malachi 2.15. He says, has not one God made you? You belong to him in body and spirit. And what does the one God seek? Godly offspring. So be on your guard and do not be unfaithful to the wife of your youth. Just saying there. So be careful how you live. Be careful that you bring up your kids and, and, the, and the encouragement and admonition and teaching and discipleship of the Lord. Because when you bring godly offspring into the planet, that helps. That helps. When they, you learn more about life in your first, certainly, 18 years from your parents than you do anybody else. I have lots of fine teachers and people that poured into me and things, but my model for life and how to live it has mostly been poured into me from my parents. Christmas Eve night, Mom had us all go around and share how we see God using us in the unique way that he's made each of us to be a blessing to the world. And so we thought for a little bit about and each each one shared, and, you know, and Teresa shared, uh, she said, you know, like each snowflake, there's billions and billions of snowflakes, and not one snowflake is exactly like another snowflake. 
You know what the Lord is doing? The Lord's not just showing off there. The Lord is showing how incredibly uh, ingenious, creative, diverse, and amazing that God is. And that how every, and every person doesn't look like another person is made completely with a, a 100% different DNA than all these other people around the planet. And so we were sharing uh, how God had made us to help benefit and serve other people around us. Well, it got to my mom. And she said, you know, for me, she said, I think the handiwork God has used in me has, has been to have four children. So my legacy has been four children that are uh, contributing to uh, the world by being highly involved in God's kingdom's work, be involved in the gospel. It's a good thing for people to wholeheartedly love Jesus and to wholeheartedly love their children in, in a way that, that pours into them, that they, where they become also in the work of the gospel, giving their life to something that which outlasts this one. The protection of our children is the third one. Moving on, another reason God has designed for us for marriage is for the protection of our children. You know, there's nothing more vulnerable than a baby. You can't blow your own nose when you're a baby. I, I so uh, <laughs> thought it was kind of fun, you know, a little suction device. You jam in your, your baby's nose, you know, and you get to squeeze it and then let it go, and you suck out the, the, all the snot dripping off, and you're like, oh, look at that. <laughs> you know, and, but no adults let you do that, right? That's only a, only a baby, and they need you to do those things. They can't even change their own pants. They can't even turn over on their back. I mean, you have to, like, lay them down in a certain way, you know, and now they want you back to sleep so they don't get hurt or anything, and so they put them on your back, and they, they sleep better, and they're supposed to sleep better. All of these things, it's really, it's motivated me to, e each year, they have the $100 tax credit that you can give, uh, I give it to Oregon Right to Life, uh, because I think the most vulnerable human beings should be protected. Now, you get that $100 back on your taxes anyway. It's a credit, but I, it, it's something that goes to my heart. It says every human being, especially our most vulnerable, should absolutely be protected. They should not be brought out of that secret place and be ripped limb by limb. Instead, they should have the protection of people around them. And because of the brokenness, again, that doesn't always happen. But in this time in our life, we need absolute need of a loving parent, hopefully a loving, in a loving marriage where both mom and dad are present and to love and support, bringing to the table both aspects of the image of God in which we bear. God knew children need a safe environment, somebody to feed you, to dress you, to take care of you and protect you, guide you. I was reading uh, multiple articles over the years. I, in fact, I wrote down, you know, this probably represents a, a summary of a 50 studies on raising healthy kids. Basically have shown that with a mom and dad present, there's increased risk that they're not going to fail in school or th they're going to be kept from failing in school. Uh, kids without two parents at their home, uh, bring them up. Kids without two parents more likely to not to graduate from college. Kids without two parents are more likely to be involved in substance or alcohol abuse. They're more likely to experience distress, depression, risk of suicide. More likely for jail time. They're more likely to live their entire lives in poverty. They're more likely to increase risks and they in, also uh, be divorced or bear children outside of marriage. On the other hand, children who live with uh, their own two parents growing up, statistically proven, will enjoy better physical health. Uh, children living in a family form it's not just me saying these things it's it's all these studies both secular and christian both agree wholeheartedly ab about the importance of a mom and dad in a family relationship and, and the benefits of that and you would think after the amount of documented studies after study available to us that in our society it sort of have an all hands on deck Movement from Hollywood, from politics, from government institutions. You think, wow, we need to begin celebrating the difference uh, that, in, that makes in a marriage relationship. We need to celebrate the difference in the genders that God made both male and female for good reasons and they complement each other to, to bring up people in a healthy way. And God designed marriage for a reason to meet many needs in the society. 
You'd think that everybody would be on board with that. Just after study after study, what it's saying. But I won't hold my breath. But it's good for those who are wise. It's good for those the wise that live in these truths that know there's a blessing in living inside the boundaries that God has for us. God's plan, Proverbs 14, 26. Whoever fears the Lord has a secure fortress. And for their children, it will be a refuge. You know, whenever I'm talking to high school kids or middle school kids, I, I, you know, sometimes I hear them complaining, you know, my dad and mom won't let me use my phone all night long, all day long. My mom and dad won't let me watch this. And my mom and dad, that's like, man, you do know that your mom and dad are a blessing given to you by God. You do know, I hope that they are a refuge, refuge for you. And, and you may not know that now or appreciate that now, but please don't be so quick to step out of it. Please don't be so quick to just want to go your And I know you get in those upper teenage years and you're just kind of, you know, we're getting ramped up a little more independence, a little closer to, hey, this is my own life. But man, just know your parents are a refuge. They're a refuge for you, a fortress in which they offer protection. And no one besides God loves you as much as those uh, parents that God's put in your life. Now, I know there's exceptions and there's been bad examples, but by and large, people that agree to be parents and, and are listening to the Lord, certainly in those, are a refuge. Uh, I thought about uh, this week, preparing for this message, the, just thinking about the night, the evening of, of the, the ducks uh, Oregon Ducks, they lost to the Auburn University team in the national championship game. Anybody remember that? It was like 2011. It was like what, seven years now or so. Well, the reason why I remember that is not because the Ducks were playing the national championship game or that they lost. The reason I remember that night so well was we had a bowl party here at the church, and it was a fellowship time. We were bringing the church together. We were going to watch the, the big game together. And... Um, and Kelly and I were going to get some sub sandwiches and then bring them to the church to eat here and things. And we got our wires crossed and who was picking up Allie from her dance class on, on River Road. And uh, as we're talking on the phone, we're realizing that neither one of us had picked up Allie. And she's just a seven-year-old. And um, it's 20 minutes past the pickup time. And both of us are uh, envisioning uh, Allie sitting in the dark, you know, outside of a dance studio just by herself and so as soon as we found out from each other we neither one of us had picked up Allie it dropped the phone and I began just hauling my truck down to River Road in fact it's the only time I can remember it. Kelly and I came into the parking lot at the same time it's the only time I ever can remember my wheels squealing as I was coming into a parking lot or anywhere else I was going pretty fast pull in the parking lot, throw open the door, run across the parking lot, out comes Allie skipping across the parking lot, jolly along. And Kelly had talked to the teacher, fortunately got a hold of a teacher, and she was staying with Allie and Route over there, and she was kind of whispering to us, trying to like, she doesn't even know. You know, Allie doesn't know that she's been forgotten, and so we were like trying to keep it on the download, hey Allie, and just right at the same time, almost hyperventilating, like, oh, you're you're here, you're safe. Thank you to the teacher who stayed after with you. Put her in our car. It's like, ah, she's with us. And I thought about this week. How Allie had two parents coming for her at breakneck speed. Wanting her to feel like she wasn't forgotten for 15 minutes. I thought about the hundreds of thousands of kids that are in great need where nobody's ever coming for them. I came into our house door, you know, this week, and Kelly had been watching the news, and she said, Alan, I feel like I've just gotten punched in the stomach. It's like, why? What's going on? You know, this way. Thinking, why? This is why we don't watch the news. And I just thought it was something related to the news, and sure enough, it was. And she said, uh, one of the kids in her class, this year, the mom was arrested just about the last year or two. You probably saw it on the news where a, there was a hit and run, and it actually pulled the body along uh, with the car for a while. That gal was this, uh, the mom of this student. And, and then the live-in, you know, the boyfriend thing, over the Christmas break, this Christmas break, just got in trouble for some kind of sexual crime. And um, 
is going to be arrested and going to, going to jail. And Kelly just said, the students in my class, where's she going? Who's going to be there for her? I, uh, I was encouraged by our 24-hour prayer time that we do as a church the third Saturday where we get together with One Hope Churches. We're all praying together different, different days of the month. So every day of the month is covered by 24-hour prayer. And, and we've been praying for all kinds of things, government institutions, our, our, our city, our county, um, our churches, our schools, our first responders, and it's just been amazing how God is, well, the, mo uh, the most uh, amazing thing recently for me, as I've seen, is we've been praying for the foster care uh, system, and they're always uh, underwater, well, they've always been underwater with the amount of kids in the system and the amount of, of families that are needing foster care uh, for their kids, and uh, more and more, not as many exiting the system as are coming in, and right now there's less coming in uh, to the foster care system. And the coolest thing that happened was a Christian counselor uh, has been asked to host a training for all foster care parents. And it's not just the Christian foster care parents, not just people, members of First Baptist Church or anything, but DHS has asked all foster care parents to come to this training by Christians to learn the tips of doing foster care. I say that because Kelly also was talking to me about, Alan, do you think we'd ever be open to doing emergency foster care? And I was like, you know, yeah, not to pray about that, think through that. This girl here in Kelly's class probably handed over to an institution, you know, and, but kids really need a family, right? I read some good news how in uh, Rwanda, because of great Christian ministries, and I know some of the churches in, involved in this, Rwanda has maybe become the first country to not need orphanages anymore. Because the Christian churches and ministries in there, and it's happening some in Uganda also, because of the amount of Christians living there and coming to Christ, they're saying, hey, let's take care of our people in homes, not institutions. Uh, my dad was telling me in between the services, he said, you know, that's so true about the need for a family and uh, bringing them into the family rather than orphanages and things. I just give them a bed, a shower, and enough food to eat for the day. And, you know, certainly there's, there's some benefit to that, but it's not how God designed it. My dad was telling me about my, my cousin Scott and, and Sue, uh, or Mike and Sue, my Scott's my other cousin, his brother. Mike and Sue adopted a young Russian little boy and uh, for years and years, he was in the Russian orphanage system and things, and they went over there and adopted him from Russia, and, and now he's much older, teenage, and there's teenage years, and they're still going through lots of therapy, lots of counseling to try and undo these years, just no one being there for him. Just, I mean, we need more than a warm bed, a shower, and enough food to eat. We need things like affection. We need emotional support. We need somebody that says... I'm so proud of you. I care about you. And under God's plan, children have a refuge of not worrying about whether dad's going to walk out or mom's suddenly leaving. They can worry about the daily worries of just getting their homework done, navigating friendships and relationships at school. And in the past, you used to hear about couples, they'd say, they stayed together for the sake of the kids, and for many generations it was like that, where people stayed together for the sake of the kids. It was considered an, an honor or a compliment. They, they were unselfish. They were mature. And they stayed together for the sake of the kids, and it wasn't the most ideal thing. Certainly you'd want them to be rekindle the romance and, and, and try and, and have something more than just together, but it was a, a, an, an unselfish way of looking at things. And today, people laugh at that statement. Staying together for the sake of the kids. What are you talking about? You got to do what's best for you. You always have to do what's best for you. I've heard a, heard a counselor, a secular counselor, I, I got the notice from the, these people that this is what this counselor said to us that if you're not happy, life's too short, get out. I was like, that came from a counselor? Yeah. I said, yeah, please don't go back to them. You always have to do what's best for you? No, that's called narcissism. 
Can you sometimes do something that's maybe best for somebody else? Can you sometimes do something that's best for somebody for the sake of someone who's a little bit more vulnerable than you? When you do that, that's called maturity. That's called unselfishness. Ultimately, that's called love. In the invitation time, I think it's just great to share with you that that's what Jesus is all about. Jesus unselfishly came down to this planet to let us know how much he loved us and how much he cared for us and how much he said he, he, he made us. But he not only made us, he bought us at a huge price in order to communicate how much he didn't want to live without us. He said, I love you so much. I'm going to lay down my life for you to bring you into my family. That you may have a family home, and, and, and not only that, but in grace and unmerited favor, I want you to know how proud I am of you. How great I think you are. It's like, wow. Wow, Lord, I didn't know. Yeah, yeah, I died for you. You're precious to me. And though we might see in human relationships, because of the brokenness of sin coming into the world, we bump into each other, we hurt each other, and there's a lot of brokenness. But Jesus never lets us down. He's our Savior, and He's the one that's trying to help us pick up the pieces and see things repaired and brought back to Him ultimately. He loves you, and He wants a relationship with you. If you don't know Him yet, I pray today would be the day that you say, yes, Jesus, come into my life. I want you in my life today. Make Him your Father. If you've never had a Father, He'd like to be the perfect Father to you. Would you just stand during this time and this time of invitation and just celebrate this God that loves us so much that wants to bring us into His family and one an invented marriage so that you'd have companionship and, you know, and, and, and love and, and, and not be lonely.